Welcome and thank you for attending and jumping into this webinar hosted by Go Engineer about SolidWorks and drivers tools to address configurations. Uh, I'll try. I'll be doing my best to keep an eye on the Q and A box. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and throw them into the Q and A, and I will get to them uh, to the best of my ability. My name is Greg Dawes, uh, and I'm going to be your guide here today. Uh, I've got a lot of content to cover this afternoon. Um, so we'll get moving here. I've been in uh, the reseller channel for SolidWorks for about 10 years now. I am DriveWorks Pro certified. I'm a CSWE and Elite AE, so I've got all the alphabet soup of uh, certifications. Um, and we'll get moving on the topic. The agenda that we have for today, I'm going to talk first a little bit uh, outside of the software and talk about the impact of configurations. Um, what are configurations? How do they affect our uh, design approach? Uh, and then we're going to be talking about SOLIDWORKS tools to address configurations. So I really lump this into three categories. Uh, they do have some overlap, but I really lump it into manual configurations, uh, using SOLIDWORKS design tables, and then using Excel-based uh, design tables. After we kind of talk about those tools that SOLIDWORKS has to address configurations, we're going to jump, jump back up and talk about the impact of configurations when it comes to the software that we're using, the design tools that we're using, and how we manage all of those designs of configurations. So a little bit back more to the impact of configurations. After that, um, we're going to talk about DriveWorks. So if you've never heard of it before, I'm going to introduce DriveWorks uh, configurator and automation software. Uh, we're going to talk about the workflow it takes to get to from a SOLIDWORKS design to a fully functional DriveWorks configurator. Uh, we're going to talk about the different products that are available in the DriveWorks lineup and then talk about what's next. Uh, if uh, if you're interested in what DriveWorks is or if you have questions on any of the uh, SOLIDWORKS tools to address configurations, what are, your, what are your next steps? So we'll start with the impact of configurations. And uh, I actually have a Moe's in my hometown uh, that uh, I go to every once in a while. And this sign is hanging up in the Moe's. It says, more than 17 quintillion combinations. And I was like, wow, that's a, a really big number. How, how in the world do you even get to that number? How do you even calculate that number? Uh, I, I've got no idea. So I kind of thought about it and broke it down to be something really simple. So let's say I'm a company, really simple company, that uh, makes arrows that point up, arrows point to the, to the right, arrows that point down, and arrows that point to the left. And uh, I'm getting really fancy here. Uh, I can make the, any of those uh, arrow directions uh, red, green, blue, or yellow. So how many different combinations uh, can I make for my product line? How many different combos do I have? Well, it's a pretty simple equation, it turns out. You just take uh, the number of options that you have for each category and multiply them. So I've got four different arrow directions, I've got four different colors. There we go. We can make red, green, blue, yellow, up, to, uh, right, down, left. We can make 16 different arrows. So if I'm just dealing with SOLIDWORKS, that's not a big deal. I can do that. I can break that out really quickly. Boom, we got our models, assign some part numbers, and we're done. Uh, and then I thought I'd expand on this idea. Uh, what if um, I go to a car configurator website and I try to figure out how, exactly how many options of this 2019 Camaro can I go through? So if we look up at the top, you'll see that we actually have different, our different categories here. Uh, the configuration, trim levels, we got colors, we got packages. I'm starting to get worried here that we're going to have a lot of options. We've got exterior options, interior options, and accessories. Oof. Well, I actually went through it, uh, and I won't bore you too much. We'll jump through it. But we got coupe convertible, we got engine, we got trim, exterior colors, exterior color additions like hockey stripes or hood stripes, interior colors, 16 different just packages in general of different options that you can have nine different wheel combos two different tires and the list goes on so that's it right it's a simple equation but there's a lot of numbers there so i did the math for you we have 125 trillion with a t 406 billion with a b 683 million 136 thousand different configurations of this camaro i highly doubt chevrolet on their back end has a CAD model for every single one of these options. And even if they could, I doubt they'd want to, because I'm 
I looked up the number just before we jumped in uh, to this webinar. They've sold about 5 million uh, Camaros over time. So uh, why make 125 trillion different uh, CAD models? So we're starting to see that what you may think of small different options, adding another color or adding another trim, uh, what that might do to the impact of your CAD models. So we've kind of set the table here to um, introduce configurations in SolidWorks and talk about what we, we might be able to do beyond that. So let's talk about uh, the three different ways within SolidWorks that I think we can manage configurations. Uh, and the first one is manual configurations. So um, we're going to be using this socket throughout the rest of the, the webinar here. Uh, and I'll be demoing with it too, pulling up the software and I'm playing around. Uh, the socket's a really good example for configurations because it's the similar but different. It's the same but not the same, right? Uh, we're always going to have a cylinder. It's going to have some chamfers on the top and bottom. It's going to have um, a certain height, but it could be tall or short. But it's always going to be a cylinder, uh, and it's always going to have the cutout for the size. Maybe that could be a 6-point socket or a 12-point socket. But a really good simple example to show um, configurations. Let's jump into the manual configurations first. Oh, uh, actually back up one here. Uh, tips to get started on any of these configuration processes, whether it's uh, the 3A SolidWorks options or even in DriveWorks, what I like to do to get started is kind of organize my model. And uh, to do that, uh, you can right click on the annotation folder in uh, the feature tree and turn on show feature dimensions. And then you can go to your view dropdown, or even in the heads up display, go to your view dropdown and turn on dimension names. And that's how you get the visual that you see over here at the right, where I'm seeing all of the uh, dimensions that drive this model and all of their names in parentheses below the dimension. So to show that real quick, we'll jump into SolidWorks. And it's real quick, right click on the annotations folder and turn on show feature dimensions. And then I go to the view dropdown in the heads up display and I can show dimension names. So um, I, I don't, I know a lot of people that do configs that don't know about this. So I thought I'd sprinkle in that little, uh, little tip there. Next up, we'll talk about the first uh, method in doing configurations and that's, I call it manual configurations. And if I'm being a little looser, I call it tree hopping. And the reason I call it tree hopping is that we're jumping back and forth between the feature manager design tree and the configuration manager or the configuration tree. We're jumping back and forth between these two, either creating new configs or grabbing dimensions or, uh, or properties that are being configured in the feature manager tree. Uh, so the first thing you wanna do is jump from the feature manager to the configuration manager and right click out in space and hit add config. One of the uh, mistakes that a lot of especially new users will make is they'll actually pre-select. You'll see that that's kind of highlighted in blue before they right click and hit add configuration. And it can be easy to miss that you're adding a derived configuration here. So we don't want that. You want to click off in space and hit right click add config. Uh, maybe in a, in a future one, we'll talk about derived configurations, but here we're just talking about flat configurations. So again, jump into the software and to create a new config. I'm going to right click out in space and hit add configuration. Uh, and we're going to give it some properties. We're going to talk about these in a second. I can give it a name. I can give it a, a description. So we'll call it six point uh, 20 millimeter tall socket is my description. And I hit OK. Now I have a uh, separate configuration. What a lot of people don't know is that we're always working in configurations because we've always got this default one. But once you start going down this path and creating multiple, we can always come back and take that default one and get rid of it. All right, so we're kind of ready to go here to hop back and forth between our feature manager and our configuration tree. Next up, that box that we just typed into and we defined our configuration properties, a couple of things I want to highlight. You can choose to use the description in the bill of material. There's a little option in there that a lot of people like. Uh, and the part number field in the bill of material, we can choose what property we want to use, whether we want to use the configuration name, the description, uh, or just the part name itself. Then to start configuring dimensions and features, 
uh, now that we have, uh, if we have multiple, it'll pop up and say just this configuration all or choose which one when we apply dimension or suppress unsuppressed features when we're in that. So let's do that. I'm going to jump into my CAD model and I'm going to add another configuration. And this one I'm going to call 12 point 22 millimeter short socket. We could choose to use that description in the bill of materials. We could also choose uh, the configuration name, specify our own name or the document name for the part number in the bill of materials. So now we've got 01, 02. I'm going to activate by double clicking each one of these configurations. Hopefully you can see that one's grayed out and one looks active. And then jump back to my feature manager. And so because this is the six point version, I'm going to take my 12 point feature, just click on it and use that pop up to suppress it. Now we got our 6.1. I'm going to go to my uh, dimension. It's going to drive the size of this thing. And I'm going to call it, uh, what do we call it, 20? And I'm going to say just for this box won't pop up if you only have one configuration. Because we have two, you can say only for this configuration, change that to 20. And we'll rebuild. And I'll have to manually update the diameter of the cylinder. I want it to be that 20 plus a six millimeter wall thickness just for this configuration. All right, starting to look good here. Uh, and we wanted a tall one, so I'm gonna make that 30. Great. All right, then I would jump back and forth like I call this tree hopping. We'll tree hop back to the configuration manager, activate that other config, and make the same changes that I made before. This was gonna be a 12 point, so I'll leave that feature alone but I will have to make those two changes to the individual config of 22 millimeters. I want this to be 22 plus six for the cylinder. And I want this to be a short one. So this is gonna be 15 and half the uh, distance that we cut those hexes down. Rebuild. And now we have two different configurations that we can play with. This one and this one. And oh, I already made a mistake, right? I need to go back to the one that's tall. And when I make that cylinder diameter change, I need to say only for this configuration. Change that back to 30. Change this back to 15. All right, so now we have our tall 6.20. We have our short 12.22. All right. So that's how we go through tree hopping between manual configurations. Uh, we can also, uh, I'm not gonna dive into these and show these, but I've got this slide for you here for later. Uh, we can also uh, configure the material. We can configure custom properties and we can configure a lot of other stuff. And I kind of made a list here um, and things that we cannot, just some highlights. But if you really wanna, I've got a, uh, a link within this PowerPoint that takes us to the help document uh, for configurable parameters. All right, on to our second option here uh, of uh, tools within SOLIDWORKS to address configurations, and that is a SOLIDWORKS design table. So let's jump in here. And uh, SOLIDWORKS design tables uh, is exactly what we just did, except we can organize it and get back to it because we're going to put the, the uh, functional uh, size of the socket, the cylinder diameter, and the height of the socket, and the 12 point feature that we're going to suppress and unsuppress all within a table, instead of just having to remember which ones that we came back to. Especially if we make this design and then somebody else has to deal with it later, uh, it's a lot easier to deal with it within a table instead of uh, really there's no communication method to what was configured in the manual method. So to start out, um, we'll just right click whatever we want to configure, whether that's a dimension, whether that's a feature, or whether that's the material within the material, uh, within the feature tree. And you'll see the options accordingly. Right click, you'll see configure feature. Right click a dimension, you'll see configure dimension. And guess what? If you right click material, you'll see configure material. So let's get back to our example. And I'm gonna close that guy out and reopen him. So we're starting from scratch. And uh, if I want to create a table, I will just 
take my 12 point feature, right click on it, and choose configure feature. This will start, that will start my SolidWorks design table. Then I can add things to it by just double clicking. So if I want the diameter of the cylinder in my table, I can double click the cylinder, double click the dimension, and that'll apply it to my table. You'll notice I had to double click the cylinder just to even see the dimensions. And that's why a lot of the times I'll show my dimensions ahead of time. But you can always uh, right click that column and hit delete too. Trying to keep an eye on the Q&A. Looks like nothing's coming in yet. So uh, just uh, keep in mind, if you do have questions, throw them in that Q&A box. Here I'm also going to put in my dimension, functional dimension, my cylinder dimension, uh, whether it's a 12 point or not, and I'm going to suppress or unsuppress that. Oh, what else do we have here? We have the hex depth and the height. Now we have this all in a table. Uh, I can just click into here, type my new config names and make the changes as I see fit. So this is going to be 20. This is going to be 22. Uh, my cross flats. Oh, that's going to be, I've got those mixed up. There we go. 20 and 22 for the functional dimension. The hex depth is going to be uh, 15 for this one and 8 for this one. Suppress this one. We don't have to do it exactly the same as we did before, but this will be 28. This will be 26. And we want this to be 15. So we don't have to jump back and forth between the uh, feature manager and the design tree. We can dr uh, drive it all through this one table. Before I close that, let's jump to the next slide. Um, and I think I already went through this. We'll double click to add things, uh, add columns to the table. And then to add properties to the table within that table while it's open, we'll see this hide show custom properties button. And then lastly, I always like throw this out there in big text, name and save the table or you won't be able to get back to it. Okay. So let's jump in here and I'll talk about that. If we wanted to add properties to this, I could hit the hide show properties button and it'll add custom properties here. I can even add a new one. I'm going to call this one maybe finish and we'll have Chrome. We'll have black oxide, All right? So not only can we do dimensions and features, we can also do custom property uh, properties like uh, like finish. Uh, we could add material to this as well. But the big thing I want to point out here is if you are doing this method, we won't be able to get back to this table that we currently have unless we name it and save it. So I always just call it configs. And then the button right next to the name is the save the table view. If I hit apply and OK, and I go to my configuration manager now, I now have the configurations that we made. Cross your fingers that I put in all the right dimensions. I did. And above the configurations, we have a, a folder called tables. There's my table. I can always double click that and get back to it. So if you didn't name and save the table, it would still create your configurations. It would still make the dimensional changes and the feature changes. It just wouldn't give you this table to come back to. So that's that second method of SolidWorks tools to be able to manage configurations. Uh, the last one within SolidWorks that we're going to talk about is Excel driven design tables. And I, I think I might just uh, walk through the slides on this one because this would take a little bit of time. Like I said, I got a bunch of content to walk you guys through today. Uh, but Excel driven design tables. Uh, to start an Excel driven design table, uh, you just, in, within a part, you'll go to uh, insert tables and choose design table. And it should be pretty evident because you'll see that little green X, like the Excel logo uh, next to the design table. And then uh, you'll choose, I usually choose auto create unless you really know what you're doing. Um, I would choose auto create. You can link it to an external file or create it from scratch, but I've always found the easiest way is to just do the auto create. Um, 
We can choose whether or not we want the edits uh, in the model to update the table or not. And then choose which things might automatically get added to the table or what add new rows and columns in the design tables for new parameters or configs, uh, a few options there for the design table. Uh, it will pop up a box every time to show you all of the dimensions that you've got in your model and whether or not you want to add them. I usually skip this because we can do the same as before and just double click on them in the SolidWorks arena to get those going. I'll at least show you that option. So let's close that socket again, start from scratch. Uh, we'll do recent models here, there we go. And as always, and what I should have done before, right click show feature dimensions, use that drop down for your view to show your dimension names. And then to start my Excel driven design table, I'm going to go to insert up at the top, tables, design table. I'm gonna auto create this table and I'm gonna allow the uh, model edits to update the table, just like the table edits will update the model. Leave everything else pretty well stock. Once I click that button, it's actually going to create an Excel table and show me that within the SOLIDWORKS software. Kind of neat, right? I always ask people when I'm, when I'm training this, what piece of software are we in, Excel or SOLIDWORKS? And whatever they say, I just say, yeah, we are. <laughs> right? So we are in SOLIDWORKS in Excel. Uh, it's going to show us all the dimensions that we have available. We can click on these to add them to the table. Or if you've got it open, you can just click in any of the row two columns like I'm gonna pick in C2 and add the dimensions to the table and even add the features to the table. You'll notice that it kind of gives it its own um, expression of an unsuppressed or suppressed. And that's how we start to build our uh, Excel driven design table. Once you've done this once, um, you should be able to just click out in space and it will close that Excel look to it and if we jump over to the configuration manager, you should see that table again, and you can tell the difference between uh, regular SOLIDWORKS configurations and Excel-driven configurations. Uh, they change the logo. So instead of just a little box, it's now a green X, and I can always get back to that table. Uh, I like to, especially if you're working in like a dual screen environment, uh, when I right click that table to open and get it again, you have the two options here, edit table and edit table in new window. I like to choose the edit table in new window. So you have an Excel screen and a SOLIDWORKS, uh, I'm sorry, an Excel window and a SOLIDWORKS window that you can work uh, in independently. And I'll toss, oh, for example, I'll toss Excel to the left. I'll toss SOLIDWORKS to the right and be able to work uh, in both at the same time. Just a little tip there for you. Any dimension that is being driven by Excel is gonna be a different color in your SOLIDWORKS model now. It's gonna be that kind of hot pink fuchsia looking color. All right. Uh, that's the first thing I talk about on the next slide actually, is right clicking and choosing edit table or edit table in new window and what that does differently functionally. Just like before when we had configuration properties and we were choosing um, what uh, we're gonna use for properties in the bill of material, we have those same options driving in Excel, uh, what we want the description to be and what we want the part number to be. And what that looks like uh, after you've added those dollar sign description or dollar sign part number fields to your Excel table, uh, you'll have a drop down uh, to link it to either uh, what the document name, the configuration name, or the parent. Then quickly here, I just threw this um, because I get this, we've gotten all this a lot in when, when people start diving down the configuration path and specifically uh, Excel driven design tables, they always have a question uh, at some point they run into it of how to do material. It can be a little trickier, uh, but it is in the help files and I threw it on this slide for you. Uh, so when this is distributed later, you can reference back to it, uh, but you basically uh, use this uh, certain syntax to call out the library name and the material name. So right there, it's got it. Uh, the default SOLIDWORKS materials library is just dollar sign library material. And then you put at sign and whatever your part name is. That's what you'll put in that uh, vertical column in Excel. 
some of the benefits to Excel, um, why I use Excel, it looks a little bit more complicated. Um, some of the benefits I've thrown on a few slides here. Uh, you'll notice that I was trying to keep track of the math that I was using between the functional size of the socket and the outer diameter of the cylinder each time, whatever the value was, plus six. I can build that into my table in, in Excel. Uh, we can use equations just like you would use equations in any other function of Excel. So I can say cell C3, let's use a pointer here, cell C3 plus six is always going to be the cylinder diameter. I can build that uh, intelligence into my table. Another benefit is logic statements. So if the cylinder depth is tall or short, it's either 30 or 15. So then I can say that how far we cut the hexagons for the functional size of the socket is dependent on the cylinder depth. I can say if the cylinder depth is 30, then I want the hex depth to be cut down 16. Otherwise, cut it down 8. Again, just using uh, pretty basic Excel logic for logic statements. Uh, and then further is data validation. So if I only want people to choose from certain options in Excel, we've had that for a long time. You can apply data validation to a cell and uh, limit people to pick certain options. So in this case, I limited people to pick a finish of either po uh, polish or bead blast. Uh, and then finally, uh, just a more complicated version of this that'd be really tough to do, if not impossible in just standard SOLIDWORKS configurations without an Excel table, is some concatenation. Uh, so I'm uh, this property is just the description of the model, uh, or it's a configuration-specific description. And I'm building this using, I don't have to type it every single time, I'm just going to make a rule and apply it to this entire column that relates to the functional size, the cylinder depth, and whether or not the 12 point feature is suppressed or unsuppressed. So, uh, you know, I'm not gonna walk through that whole thing, but if you know Excel decently, you can really build some intelligence into your configurations. So let's, we've got our, our tool belt of configuration tools inside of SOLIDWORKS. Let's get back to this idea of the impact of configurations on our SOLIDWORKS models now. Now we know how to use configurations, we dive down that road, our product's perfect for it. Um, let's talk about those impact, the impact of using those configurations. This is that socket, but it's kind of taken that socket to completion of uh, only two different sizes. I have two different cylinder depths, a tall so let me use my pointer here. So this orange is just a 12 millimeter socket. The 13, uh, the, the green is a 13 millimeter socket. So it's only two sizes here. But because we've got these options and you saw how fast adding an option expands the number of configurations, you can see I've got two uh, cylinder depths. Blue's tall, short for 12, tall, short for 13. Okay, now we've got whether the 12, it's a six point socket or a 12 point socket. Unsuppressed, suppressed for a 12 tall. Unsuppressed, suppressed for a 12 short. I'm not gonna walk through the rest of the table. I think you get the idea. I tried to color code it pretty well. But uh, the idea bit being that our configurations blow up really fast in just the number of configs. And, and how does that affect our experience in using SOLIDWORKS? Real quick, um, just the file size. The file size grows a crazy amount as we start to add these uh, different configs. So if I've just got 32, the slide you saw before was 32 different options, uh, it's still in the kilobyte range, right? As I add just one size, right? So we went from two sizes to three sizes. So maybe I had a 14 millimeter option. It goes from, uh, it goes from half a meg to two megs. Then I add a whole socket set, right? 17 sizes and four different finishes. I have a 20 meg file that's representing just a socket. So it can start to blow up your file size, which is gonna affect performance in SOLIDWORKS for sure. And this is a really simple model. It's only a part, not an assembly, and it's a really simple part at that. So kind of, kind of take that into consideration as you start moving down this configuration road. So, if you're starting to find the ceiling on what SOLIDWORKS can handle when it comes to configurations, uh, 
there is a gold partner that's been around uh, the SolidWorks world for a really long time called DriveWorks. Uh, we're going to go into what it is, what the workflow is to get it going, uh, the product structure for it, and then some resources for you to move forward if uh, you're interested. So what is DriveWorks? DriveWorks is a configuration and automation software. Uh, it is a tool that can be used internally as a design tool. It is also a tool that you can build to release to uh, either a distribu distribution channel or your very end user. Uh, we can build up projects to be run on desktop, mobile, tablet, your phone, you name it. Uh, and then the automation piece, it's built to do similar but different products like we're talking about. Uh, its core focus is driving SOLIDWORKS parts, assemblies, and drawings, but it's really, really capable at doing other documentation that's product specific, uh, that's order specific as well. So proposals, emails, uh, quotes, manufacturing data that might be in Excel, Word, PDF form. Uh, it's really good at taking inputs from an end user and generating CAD and uh, supporting documentation as well. It's a gold partner with both SOLIDWORKS and Microsoft. That gold partner with SOLIDWORKS uh, really means that uh, just SOLIDWORKS has vetted it and it's a, uh, a product that is embedded in the SOLIDWORKS user interface uh, to some extent. So let's go through uh, the workflow of what it takes to build up that same kind of socket in DriveWorks. Uh, the workflow is really just four things. We're gonna uh, open that model up in SOLIDWORKS with the DriveWorks add-in turned on, and we're gonna capture the things that change. The things that change could be dimensions, features, custom properties. We can drive drawings. We can save out different file formats like Step or Parasolid, or if you're a sheet metal house, we can save out a flat pattern of that sheet metal in DXF format. You name it, uh, if you've got an application, throw it out there for me and I can, I can give you a yes, no. But we're gonna capture all of the things that we're gonna drive about the model. Then we design a form. So that's what that's the image that you see on this page, this socket order form. Uh, we're gonna design a form that someone fills out and then hits go to create the model. So in this case, uh, we've got that functional socket size. If we want it to be a 12 point or a six point, I've got some fanciness on this one where it's going to update this picture to a six or a 12 point if someone changes it. Uh, what material we want it made out of. And I have a description of the material uh, as we switch materials. A finish drop down, a height, whether it's tall or short. Try to do a, uh, a good cross section of the different controls that we can put in DriveWorks as well. Drop down lists, input boxes, radio buttons, check mark boxes, preview uh, boxes, all sorts of stuff. Uh, after we've created our form that someone fills out, then we create uh, rules to match, to take the information that we're gathering from this form you see and push it into the model. So we're making model rules. Then we can uh, go through and create additional outputs, such as uh, maybe an e-drawing of this, or like we said, step, parasol, a PDF, a uh, bill of material that uh, pumps out if this is an assembly. All right, so let's run through this. The first piece is just capturing all of the pieces that change about this model. So if you'll give me just a moment, we'll switch back and close out of our SOLIDWORKS example and pull up our DriveWorks example. I'm gonna again turn on my feature names. And uh, this little blue red box here and this tab on the right, this is the DriveWorks add-in. So if you, you own DriveWorks, it's gonna show up in your next to your gear, the drop-down. We're gonna go to add-ins and right there, we'll turn on that DriveWorks add-in. Then to capture this model should be pretty evident there. It's highlighted, it says, hey, click here to capture the current model that I have open. Cool, I'll click right there. And then it shows a folder of dimensions and features that I've also captured. So what I need to do is just go through and across flats, that's our functional, shows up down here with the same name as it's been renamed and I just hit add and that adds that to my DriveWorks project. We're gonna grab the hex depth, we're gonna grab the cylinder diameter and the cylinder depth.
Cool. Those are all the dimensions I'm going to grab. Uh, same thing with features. I'm just going to go grab the 12 point feature from the feature tree and hit add. And that adds that to my uh, project. All these tabs along here at the bottom are also uh, uh, things that we can capture. So one that we might highlight here is custom properties. If it's already in the model, I can just check mark it next to here, but we can also add it as it generates it each time. So maybe we'll add a, a description field. We'll add a, we're gonna change the color of this based on what somebody chooses for a finish. We're gonna add, we're gonna change the material as well based on the material that someone chooses. Um, we'll add a property for finish. We'll add a property for part number, bunch of properties that we can populate based on someone filling out that form. And we'll save it. Uh, we also want to give somebody the option to download a step or a parasolid of the thing that they configured. So I'm going to go under file formats and check. Oh, I'm going to capture the step files with rules. I'm going to capture parasolid files with rules. So that's the capture section. Pretty simple. I'm going to close my model. And I can even close uh, SolidWorks at this point. I won't for now. We're going to use it later. But that's the idea on that first section of capturing the info that we're going to drive in DriveWorks. Next up is to design the form. Um, I won't design the full-blown one that I showed you in the images before, but we'll play around with a few of these controls. Um, I highlighted some of the ones that I use the most. Uh, check mark boxes, labels, lists. Uh, pictures, text boxes that you can type into, a 3D preview of the model, a macro button uh, that we can run either DriveWorks specific macros or we can even run SolidWorks macros on these models as they're generated, uh, and then radio buttons. So all sorts of different uh, controls that we can use within DriveWorks to build our form. So now we're going to jump into DriveWorks. So this is uh, the standalone piece to DriveWorks that's not built inside of SolidWorks. Uh, it's called DriveWorks Administrator. And this is where we build our the rest of our project beyond just capturing things. So uh, let's build a pretty simple form here. I'm going to grab a, oh, let's grab a numeric text box. And I'm going to call it socket size. And it plops that on my form. I love this form uh, creator. Uh, it has snaps, and you can change what the snaps are to how far things are going to be apart and how close they get uh, when we snap it together. Make that a big size there. Awesome. Uh, let's go for a drop down. They call them combo boxes. I'm going to call it socket type. And there's my drop down. To feed it its different options, you have a couple of uh, ways you can do this. We'll do the simple one at first, but for each control, it has its own properties here at the right. So I'm going to go down to the items property and uh, introduce you to the rule builder. If I click these little triple dots here, that pops up the rule builder. And for a list, all I have to do is within quotes, so I'll make quotes there and then back up one. So I'm typing inside the quotes. We need to make a, a list where each item is separated by the pipe bar. If you're following along with me, uh, it's the shift key and then the key right above your enter key. That's the pipe bar. So we're going to give it, it's going to be a 12 uh, point socket pipe bar or a six point socket. When I hit OK, you can see that my control is already updated. And anytime I want to, I can hit this test button. And I can kind of play around and make sure, yep, I can top it, type into the socket size, and I can see my drop down options for the socket type. Beyond that, um, let's see, we could do an option group that's called height, in case we didn't want to do a drop down list, but we wanted radio buttons. And same type of thing, this little window is going to give me, I can have items of tall. And short. Check mark boxes for whether or not someone wants to also download a step file of their socket. And I'm going to copy paste that, change its name. To Parasolid.
and so on and so forth to be able to build up the form that you want someone to fill out to be able to drive their, the model. So we talked about the rule builder, uh, building in some logic, and we talked about uh, the controls that we can drop onto the form. Next up, that next piece of it, I know this is a little busy, but hang with me. Um, we build rules, and those rules can, I've kind of color coded this, they can be uh, project specific, so the name of the, the socket that gets generated. The relative path up at the top is, means where the socket's gonna get saved out on your system. Uh, we're gonna link things back to the form, so all of the different dimensions that we typed in will feed into our model rules. Or we can um, populate variables, use variables and constants to make rules. Like for the description, I'm gonna make a, a variable that uh, concatenates all these different properties into a description. So we'll do that real quick. We won't do a ton of them, but uh, I'm gonna go to my model rules. And I don't have any models in here to begin with in DriveWorks. But to add one that we've already captured, I just hit this blue cube to add. And we're going to grab that socket. And uh, if I check mark next to that socket, it's going to show everything that we captured from that socket. And for each one of these things, I can build a rule. So the simple one is going to be like across flats. That's going to be direct related. And I can use these tabs as well directly to the control on my form called socket size. And I just double click it. It adds that to my rule, so the return, basically what someone typed into the socket size box. I'll hit OK, and that's my rule. Um, how about the cylinder depth? That's gonna be related to if someone chose tall or short. So I'll do a quick one here, we'll do an if, just like Excel, building in an if statement, and I'll say if the height return equals tall, then I want this cylinder depth to be 30. Otherwise, I want it to be 15. You notice how that color changes when I've completed my rule? Anytime I kind of see this reddish orange color, I know that my rule isn't valid. But when I see the green color, my rule is now valid. And we'll hit OK. And it even gives us a little preview here of if Currently what's on my form is filled out. This is what my value would be. So it's gonna be a 12 millimeter socket and it's gonna be a depth of 30. So the hex depth kind of co goes along with it, right? I could write the same rule. Uh, let's just do this. We'll copy that rule I made. Just right click, copy, and paste it under hex depth. but we don't want the hex depth to be the whole thing. So I'll just say that whole thing divided by two. So now it's 15. So we it's really easy to add some intelligence into this. Uh, same thing with our 12 point feature. We're gonna say uh, the socket type, if the socket type is equal to 12, then unsuppress, otherwise suppress. And it's going to show you what it's going to do to that feature based on what the current form is. I'm keeping an eye on the Q&A. I don't see anything quite yet. Um, maybe I'm just doing that well to explain these tools. I hope that's the case. Uh, if you do have questions, there should be a Q&A in Zoom for you to be uh, to throw some questions into if you like. So um, we went through the model rules. I uh, walked you through a couple of rules and how we do them up. Uh, it's really related to um, if you've got any experience in writing rules like that into cells in Excel. Uh, most, if not all, of the function with, within Excel are usable within DriveWorks. And then I'll show you, kind of show you what if we if we take that out to the nth degree, we build out our entire form. Um, we throw some uh, kind of fancy controls on there, what it's going to look like to run that project. So let's run back to DriveWorks Administrator. I'm actually going to open up, uh, right, the magic of television. We'll open up the end result if you kept going with this socket. I'm going to run a new specification here. They just call it, each time you run one of these and create a new design, it's called a specification. And I can change 
whether it's a six point or 12 point, showing you some options here on what you can do with uh, driving pictures. The material and the description of the material is gonna update as I make changes, whether it's tall or short. And anytime I want to, as I'm filling these things out, it's actually filling out this description right above. And anytime I want to as well, as I'm starting to fill this up out and I wanna know what it looks like, I can hit this embedded preview button. What it's actually doing, and we can handle this different ways, but in this case, it's running out to SolidWorks, quickly generating that model, and then returning a really lightweight version of that 3D CAD uh, to an, uh, where, where I can interact with it, right? I can zoom in, zoom out, I can rotate around and view what that current uh, thing's gonna look like. Change it to short, hit that preview button again, it'll run to SolidWorks real quick, generate the model, and now I've got a short version of it that I can kind of preview and check out. And if I had step checked, when I hit release, uh, we can have this happen automatically or uh, have someone come into SolidWorks, uh, open up that same group, and it just generated those two sockets. So if I hit my recents right now, that is the socket that I told it to make when I said release. A benefit to this, right? Um, we saw some of the the, the downsides of even with, for, with you're using Excel and really being intelligent about how you drive things, your model's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you make more configurations. And it's gonna get a lot more unwieldy. Um, each time I run this, it's just making a single uh, file. We can have it add to a configurations list if that's what y you need. Uh, but by kind of default, it's just gonna make a new model every single time. Uh, we can do this with assemblies as well. I wanted to keep this example pretty uh, simple though, um, but we can do it with assemblies and again, generating quotes and proposals and bills of materials as well along with it. We are getting close here. So I wanna dive into uh, uh, the structure of DriveWorks. There's three different levels of DriveWorks and if you're a SolidWorks customer right now, you can use DriveWorks right now. Uh, it is uh, DriveWorks Express is a free product built right into your license of SolidWorks. Um, you do just have to reach out and uh, through mysolidworks.com to request a license, but the license is free. Uh, the, it is a pretty basic tool, um, and we can upgrade projects from Express to Solo to Pro. Uh, just an FYI, I was using Solid, uh, DriveWorks Professional uh, in this last section that I was showing. But uh, you can play around with DriveWorks Express. If your needs grow beyond DriveWorks Express, there's DriveWorks Solo, where we're always going to be building and running our projects through SolidWorks, not like we did uh, before, where I have a separate ap application to do so. Uh, but it adds a lot more functionality. We can drive things like color, material, and textures in Solo that we couldn't in Express. Uh, we can control pattern instances. We can uh, drive advanced features like the whole wizard, sheet metal, weldments features. Uh, we can do additional uh, CAD file types like pushing out DXF, PDF, and step like I showed in the example. We can now, uh, beyond Express and in Solo, we can control the file name and location where it saves the model. A lot more, a uh, ton more control when it comes to drawings. Uh, that rule builder that I showed is introduced at this stage and that form designer that I showed is introduced here. One thing I will point out about Solo 2 is that it has a 30 day free trial. So if uh, you think it might be a fit, but you're not sure, you wanna test it out, get yourself a little proof of concept, uh, reach out to us. And uh, of course we can do a demo for you, uh, specific to what your, your company's interested in, but you can also grab a, a trial. Driver, uh, Drivers Pro is the top level of it. Uh, I think some of the things that people like are putting it out on a website. You need DriveWorks Pro. Uh, pumping out file types like Word, Excel, XML documents, those uh, you need DriveWorks Pro. Uh, you do not, this is the only level where you do not need SolidWorks to run that configurator. So if you're having your end users or even internally you have a salesperson who jumps in and fills out the form and hits go, uh, they don't need to see to SolidWorks. We can connect to different business systems using like a SQL queries and API calls. So we can tie into other business systems with DriveWorks Pro. It has testing modes and reporting. It's just 
the it is is very much the professional version of this tool. So what now? Uh, if you are further interested in DriveWorks and configuration, and you've outgrown some of those SolidWorks methods, uh, I would point you to us first. Please reach out to Go Engineer, and we can uh, arrange a discovery call or a demo. We can also uh, just point you to some resources for you to do some self-service on finding out more about DriveWorks. This first one is just called uh, is just DriveWorksLive.com. Uh, it uh, right there, and it has a uh, ton of different examples on uh, live projects that are hosted on this site that you can play around with to see what's what's capable and what um, what are some uh, demonstration sites out there uh, for different industries. Another one is techstack.driveworkslive.com. So it's the same site with just a tech stack dot in front of it. And this is really, uh, all right, I get the I get the top level view of this. I get what it looks like at the end, but what are the tools available for me to build this up? Uh, if you're asking those kinds of questions, I'd point you here where there's uh, sections on this site that go through each one of the topics. Are you really just interested in automating your CAD and that's about it? Uh, go here, it'll walk you through some examples. Uh, if you wanna see some reporting on the data, if you wanna see how you push these projects through a workflow, how to create forms, integration into other business systems, the rule builder, and creating 3D previews are all a bunch of different examples on that techstack.driverxlive.com. Then specifically to Go Engineer, we offer uh, training and implementation uh, services for DriveWorks. So if it's uh, if it's looking like something that's interested to you, but a little bit too much to bite off uh, on your own, uh, we quite often do services for DriveWorks. So implementations to help you do your first projects or so, or just training, uh, whatever you see fit. 52 minutes in, and I'm pretty good. I'd say that's uh, pretty good there. So uh, I want to thank you for taking some time and jumping into the webinar. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Greg Dawes at gdaws at goengineer.com. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes to answer any questions. Uh, otherwise, have a great afternoon.